Well, good morning. I just want to add a, a word of welcome of my own to our international visitors. It is such a privilege for us to be with you today. We're delighted that you're here. And I want to say this about the gathering today. This is in, in very much intended to be a dialogue. I've had a chance to speak with many of you this morning, and I hope I have the chance to speak with many others of you over the course of this day. This, our uh, uh, first panel here, we're not going to use the podium, and there's a reason we're not going to use the podium for this panel, is it's a dialogue. It's a conversation. This is not a, this is not a lecture, and we're going to have some comments offered, but so much of our time is going to be devoted to the opportunity uh, to engage, because I think that's really the theme of today, is engagement around these important issues. Let me start out by saying just a word about Magna Carta, which, of course, that is the anniversary uh, that we are recognizing this year throughout the world. You know, it's interesting about Magna Carta. It had sort of an inauspicious beginning. It really was a dispute between the barons, the elites of England, and the crown. It was, this was not really about the rights of the common person. And moreover, after the charter is ratified or signed by the king, the king accepts the terms. Within three months, he rejects it. So it's, a, it's an inauspicious start. But there, why is, then is it so important? It's important because embedded in the initial charter, there's some provisions in the Magna Carta. It's interesting to read if you haven't read it. There's some provisions that seem so odd and so trivial to us today. There's a provision about fish weirs on the Thames River in England. But the core of Magna Carta and why it is important and why 800 years later we do pay attention to this document is there the seeds in the charter that are so profoundly important to us today. And that is restraints on the power of the executive. The king was restrained by Magna Carta. That's central, the central provisions, the one that had life, are that the justice meted out in the courts, there would be more predictability and not the arbitrary work that the, that the, the, the king's court would bring to the people. This is really at the heart of it, checks on, on executive power. Again, it was it involved the barons initially. But over the centuries, those seeds of checks on power, predictability, rule of law, President Hubbard gave a magnificent statement of the principle of rule of law that comes out of Magna Carta. All of the things he said about rule of law sort of evolve out of Magna Carta. It's, it's not a critical document, I would say, in the 13th century, but it becomes one over the centuries, particularly in the 17th century, the English Bill of Rights, great development in human liberty has its seeds in restraints on the executive. When this nation is founded, what's one of the central issues we worried about in this nation in 1787 when we're drafting our Constitution? How do you give the government sufficient power to function and lead the nation but with sufficient restraints on executive power. We've had the experience with the British Crown. How do we put that into place? And so those are the larger themes that come out of Magna Carta and why it becomes, the kernels are there in 1215, and they develop over the centuries, and they become so influential to the development of rule of law, as articulated to you by President Hubbard, as well as the creation of a democratic government where there are checks on power, where there's predictability, that's our legacy. Now, our task here today, this initial conversation, is going to be about this importance of rule of law for economic development and transparency. It's an enormously important topic today. And we have two wonderful speakers to address us. And the way we're going to proceed is this. Each of these gentlemen are going to speak to this issue about the importance of rule of law that derives from Magna Carta. 
in economic development and the importance of transparency. And so I'd like to start with John Castellani, who will be our first commenter. And then I'll turn to Tom Beyer. And then we'll have time for questions. But again, this panel is designed primarily as to be a, 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 a panel of dialogue. John Castellani is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, which represents America's leading biopharmaceutical manufacturers. He is also a former President and Chief Executive Officer of the Business Roundtable, which is an association of chief executive officers of leading United States corporations. And I'm going to ask John Castellani to, t so John Castellani works throughout the world, primarily in the pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical industry. And I'm going to ask him to reflect on the importance of rule of law principles to the work that he does and the economic development with which he is involved with. So John, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you, Dave. Um, good morning again. Let me talk a little bit about the biopharmaceutical industry and why these two principles, the rule of law and transparency, are important to the two benefits that the industry can bring to the global population. First and foremost, it's the products that our scientists and our physicians produce. They are the medicines that address the unmet medical needs around the world that are helping where you have access to those medicines to extend life, to improve life, uh, and to better the economy. Not just because a healthier population is a more productive population, but also because as an industry, we represent one of the highest con contributors to gross domestic product wherever we go. And let me put it into perspective. If you look at the pharma members, last year they invested $51 billion in research and development globally. The National Science Foundation <clears throat> tells us that that represented within the United States about 20% of all of the privately funded research and development in the United States. At the core of being able to invest in that research, is being able to attract the investment, <clears throat> the funds that fund that research. Now you think about it, medicine, the discovery of medicine is a hard, hard science. Typically, those who study us tell us that it takes about $2.6 billion, U.S. dollars, to take one medicine from the benchtop in a laboratory to the patient in the clinical setting. And it takes about 12 years to go through that process. And we are not very good <clears throat> if we were a baseball player, a football player. Our shots on goal record is such that we only get one medicine to a patient for every 10,000 10, compounds that we start with at the laboratory setting. So the benefit is therapeutic. The benefit is also economic. Because of the research and development, because of the intellectual property, because of the activity that we support as a large ecosystem, of a scientific ecosystem, it is an industry that is treasured where it exists and coveted where it doesn't exist. But in order to get it, one of the basic tenets is incorporated in the Magna Carta and still holds true today. And that is to attract that huge investment that it takes to develop that medicine. We have to get those investors an opportunity to recover on that investment. It doesn't make, they have choices. They can invest in medicine, they can invest in science, they can invest in cosmetics, they can invest in telecommunications. And so at the heart of our ability to sustain the science, is the protection of intellectual property. If we have strong intellectual property protections, then we're able to attract those investors either as individuals or through shareholders or through funds to be able to allow us to sustain what has been 
of an investment of our total annual revenues year in and year out in research and development. No other sector is that high. Sorry about the telecommunications sector, you come in second. <laughs> so, the, uh, but it, it has tremendous benefits. And part of the dilemma in having it, and as you see where intellectual property is around the world and where you see where our industry is around the world, it is primarily centered in Japan, in Europe, and the United States. But many other regions of the world want both the benefit, economic, as well as the health benefits. And the challenge is how do you provide enough intellectual property to continue to sustain the development of new innovative medicines and be able to take that development and over the course of time make those medicines affordable to all populations. That is a significant challenge and at the heart of it, protecting that intellectual property, protecting the rule of law that gives us that intellectual property is absolutely essential. On the other side, the other concept of transparency is also very essential to our industry. Transparency is absolutely necessary to sustain the research model. The research model is an open source model. We as an industry in the United States, our counterparts, our industry in Europe, have committed that we will share all of our clinical trial data with any legitimate researcher. Provided that researcher protects the individual identity of the patients that are part of those trials and that they protect the commercially confidential information. But that transparency also extends that we need those researchers to add their intellectual content to our own scientists, our own clinicians, so that the model is open source and we get the best focus for the patients that we're all trying to serve. To sustain that model, half of that $2.6 billion is in clinical trials. And where the science is going is that it is going to become, and is, more and more focused on genetically homogeneous populations, which means we need clinical trial participants to be comfortable and to participate in every part of the globe if we're, able, if we're going to be able to bring the benefits of these medicines and these therapies to all of the globe. So it is very different for a European middle-aged male than it is for a woman in sub-Saharan Africa, than it is for an Asian child, than it is for an American, a South American elderly patient. Medicines are targeted, and if we are not transparent, then we're not going to convince patients that we hold the highest standards in our clinical trials, that they are safe in participating in those, that they are benefiting the population as well as themselves, and that the medicines that are produced are not only effective in the therapies that they are targeted towards, but they are safe for the patients who take them. So the two concepts that, were, that I started and that Dave started on that are embodied in the Magna Carta are absolutely essential to get both of the benefits. And the benefits and I have been remarkable. The science has been remarkable. A disease that has vexed us around the globe for decades, HIV AIDS, is now become, for example, a chronic disease if you have access to the medicines. If you have access to the medicines and you're an HIV AIDS patient, then your life expectancy is now only three months less than a non-HIV AIDS infected patient. And that came from innovation, it came from transparency, and it came from access. But the key is you have to have the access. So Dave, I'll stop there and look forward to well, John, thank you very much. And I'd, I'd, I'd now like to uh, call on Tom Bayer to speak, uh, Bayer to speak to this, uh, this same question about the importance of rule of law in economic development. Tom is the AECOM's Director of Crisis Response and Stabilization, and AECOM is a global provider of professional, technical, and management support services uh, throughout the world. Tom? if you can address this issue of the importance of rule of law in, in the work that you do. Sure. Thank you very much, Dean Douglas. And thank you, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, John, for some good comments. 
Um, I come at this from a slightly different angle, perhaps apparent from my title. Uh, but ACOM is a, is a global enterprise that's dedicated to being a, a, a world's premier provider of, of solutions to problems on a very wide span, really being a last mile service provider for those who have the least among us and those who have the most among us and aren't quite sure what to do with it. It's a pretty unique, it's a pretty unique situation as a, as, a, as, a, as a company. Of course, the rule of law is extremely important to us and of course transparency is extremely important for us to be able to, to do our business. Coming back a little bit where I reside, within AECOM as the Director of Crisis Response and Stabilization. I focus more on the other, on the one end of the spectrum, those who have the least among us, those who countries that are emerging from conflict or from crisis, trying to help countries re with the re restoration of human dignity after, a, after a, a conflict or a crisis. And I think something that's very important to us and very interesting is that the fact that the Magna Carta started out as a peace agreement. It failed, but it became the foundation for uh, jurisprudence, and particularly in the common law tradition. And that's something that's, uh, two of the things that Dean Douglas mentioned in his comments jumped out at me. Uh, one of them was uh, seeds, and the other one was fish weirs. Now, why do I say that? Uh, the seeds jumped out at me because really what we're doing in international development and economic development in our, in our, in our, in our uh, enterprise is we're sowing seeds. We aren't changing the world. We're working in Sudan and South Sudan and Mali and Cote d'Ivoire and Afghanistan and South Asia. And we don't expect that we're going to change the world through the implementation of our programs from one day to the next. We're very, we're humble about this. And we're dedicated to sowing seeds, engaging. That's one of the reasons that we support the YALI program, as a matter of fact, is that you know, we're engaging with future leaders exposing them to new ways of solving problems, exposing them to the importance of the rule of law and transparency for economic development in an effort that they take that back home and start to apply that in their, in their own situation. Each one, there's no real blueprint for this. Each situation, each problem requires customized solutions. And that's something that we focus on very much. Fish wears, why did I mention fish wears? Because the devil's in the details. Uh, we find that right now as we're working very hard in Sudan and South Sudan on ongoing peace talks and also in Mali where the Algiers talks have just, have just uh, are stalled for the time being. Um, it's very important for us to do what we can and I think it's unique for AECOM as a global corporation to be dedicated to providing resources with the support of the United States government to help expand the appreciation for the rule of law and for transparency through things like the, the, our support of the Algiers peace talks in, in, the, in the end of the Mali conflict. So all that to say that the, the topic for this morning and this conversation, I look forward to entertaining some questions and maybe helping you understand how the broad span of business that we're engaged in, why these, why these fundamental principles are so important to us. Well, we've set the stage, and now we turn to the main event, which is a chance for uh, everyone in the room to pose questions and, and offer comments and, and so that we can dialogue about these issues. So the floor is open. If anyone has a comment or a question that they would like to make. Yes, please. We'll bring a microphone here. Good morning. I'm uh, Musa Toprak uh, from Ankara, Turkey. I would like to ask uh, uh, first to Mr. Castellini, please, about uh, I think we, we are going to have a chance to talk about this in the Magna Carta of the future, but when I was listening to you, I heard that uh, you are thinking about uh, to operate in a country with uh, the rule of law, and it's uh, saying that it's going to be better for everyone and the economy and plus. But uh, related to the uh, human rights in business, I, I, I think that it's also the responsibility of the uh, companies, especially the big companies, to uh, ensure the, all the processes of the human rights and responsibilities to the environment and people and everything. So uh, when we are talking, I get the sensation that you have responsibilities about the transparency, uh, but when it comes to the rule of law and human rights and democracy, you're uh, 
this was a sensation, I don't know, I might be wrong, but uh, you were thinking that it was someone else's job and you are going to operate in this environment that the politicians or the state has created. No, and, and uh, it's a good question because um, I didn't mean to give that impression. We were just talking about two aspects of it. You know, clearly um, in no industry, ours or anyone else's, uh, can be a successful part of an economy and be thriving within an economy and bring a benefit to the economy unless it is um, uh, absolutely uh, a good steward of all of the resources that it engages with. And so that is the, uh, the natural resources, the environment in which uh, it operates and into which it, it, it uh, uh, emits um, various things, uh, uh, most importantly um, with the, the people both the workforce that are essential uh, to be able to undertake the enterprise as well as from our perspective because we are in the healthcare field, uh, how our products are used and how they are made available and need to be made available to those patients that need them. So it is incumbent on any enterprise, whether it be global or local, to be a good steward. And the stewardship has to be defined not by us as the multinational corporations, but by the hosts uh, of the countries in which we operate. Um, you know, there's, there probably is no greater issue for us uh, in that area than um, our ability to attract um, and, uh, and have uh, local uh, patients participate in clinical trials. Well, to do that, you have to be absolutely sure that we are applying the highest medical standard to that process. That you are well informed about what is going to happen to you. That you know the outcome of those trials when they are completed. And that you are assured that in the end you will have access as a patient to the fruits of that process and those trials. So that encompasses every aspect of how we operate not just the science, but the manufacturing, the distribution, the use, and in some cases, avoiding the misuse of the medicines that we produce. So it's broad. We were talking about just those two aspects of it. Yes, please. My name is Rumbiza Dube, and I'm from Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. I was one of the Mandela Washington Fellowship uh, Fellows from last year in 2014. Uh, my question relates to your presentation, in particular, the issue of rule of law in relation to the production of generic right. medicines. How do you reconcile the existing conflict between the protection of intellectual property um, in the production of drugs that you said you invest 2.6 billion in 12 years of research into producing and the inherent right of access, universal access to medicines which has precipitated the production of generic versions of right. the drugs that you, you would have worked on. Yes. Yeah, yeah it, 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 you get right to the heart of the healthcare uh, dilemma and the delivery system that we all face. First and, and, and foremost, um, let me say this about generics. We love generics. They are all our children. Um, they don't spring from the head of Zeus. They come as a result of the balance that we have to try to achieve between enough data, uh, intellectual property protection and enough data protection uh, in patents and data protection to be able to stimulate the investment in the inherent innovative medicine and a time period by which that innovation can then transit to have an open source anybody can, can access um, that if they have the capability of manufacturing in a high quality way and provide generic medicine. So let me take for example um, the market of the United States. 85% of all the prescriptions written in the United States are for generic medicines. And so that balance that we have between that 15% and that 85% seems to be working well, and it's constantly under debate. We believe strongly that there is no inherent conflict between intellectual property protection and sustainable access 
to the medicines that that protection uh, uh, allows to be developed. That without that protection, you're stuck with a situation that everything that has been invented is all that will be invented. You know, there was a great um, head of the uh, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office in 1908 at the Chicago Exhibition, Industrial Exhibition, uh, of, of uh, the great innovation that this country had in 1908, who gave the very prescient statement that nearly everything that could be invented has been invented. This is in 1908. This is before Fermi had, had, uh, 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 had uh, uh, conducted a successful radio transmission. This is before uh, automobiles were produced. Uh, this is certainly before most of the medicines and the medical devices that are saving lives ever came into fruition. And it was long before uh, the, uh, uh, the tablet and, and, and obviously the, the uh, uh, smartphone was ever developed. That's the dilemma. We cannot stay still. The promise of the science is enormous, right now particularly. But our, what we need to do is to work to ensure that we have systems that reward the innovation and then transmit that innovation so that it becomes affordable. In our world, in our companies, no one should be denied access to our medicines because they can't afford it. And we have a lot of programs, both ourselves and with others around the world, to try to make that happen. But at its heart, no one should be satisfied where the science is now because there are still people who are dying way too early. And no better example um, uh, than the one I used, which was HIV AIDS, which was a, a, um, a, a tremendous battle between accessibility and affordability and the need for innovation. We were thankfully able to successfully work that out. Now we have to take the, the fruits of that and, and make sure that it is delivered where it's needed around the world. Um, so it is a, an important balance, uh, but we recognize that balance and we promote that um, evolution from innovative medicine to generic medicine. Another question or comment? Yes, please. Uh, my name is Badr Al Jafari. I am um, a lawyer from Saudi Arabia. Um, my question is related to the uh, link between the uh, rule of law and the um, uh, medicine uh, uh, field. I mean, uh, production. From my understanding, that one of the principles that comes under the rule of law is the equality and the accessibility to the law. When we look at the um, uh, medicine production in the world, we can realize that the, I mean, uh, uh, the production is a ex um, little bit exclusive to certain countries uh, like in the U.S. and in the Europe. Uh, is that because of the laziness of the, I mean, uh, the um, uh, people or the, the other countries in the develop uh, development countries, they can't actually uh, uh, develop them, th their, uh, themselves in a way that allow them to uh, participate in the uh, medicine uh, factory uh, development or because of the interna uh, international um, law, um, either the treaties or the local laws, that um, designed in a way that prevents such countries in participation in the um, medicine factory field. Yeah, yeah it, it, it is if you look globally. Now, the preponderance of the research and development is done in the United States, in Western Europe, and, and in Japan. And the reason that the industry is centered in those geog geographies is because of the necessity of, of a vibrant ecosystem, scientific ecosystem to be able to uh, have the discovery process be successful. So it is not just our industry. We go where there is a combination of um, uh, universities and hospitals that are capable 
um, and can contribute to the scientific ecosystem where there is government uh, research that supports, you know, we're very good at attacking a target. The National Institutes of Health in the United States are very good at identifying those targets. You have to have both. Um, what we are seeing is that there is a tremendous desire to have this industry uh, around the world. Uh, Singapore, China, India, Turkey, um, every part of the world wants to have the industry for the economic and uh, obviously the therapeutic benefits. And where they have to start is building that ecosystem. So there isn't anything inherent in treaty or in business model. What it is is you have to have the scientific ecosystem and then the infrastructure um, to be able to, to sustain this very, very difficult science. It will happen because the patients are unique around the world and it needs to be done there. Another question? Right here? Yes. Surely we can come up with one for time here. I am uh, Nakul Subedi from Nepal. Uh, my question is about the uh, uh, responsibility of uh, state or international community to ensure the accessibility and affordability of the medicine. It's a concern about the right to health issues. Um, I think more than uh, one third people of the world has not even a uh, single tablet of paracetamol to save their lives. We are talking about the um, that copyright and patent protection of the um, invention. How do you think the um, to ensure right to health of the people I think some, for example, I'm from South Asia, whether it is our unfortunate to be born in that part of the globe, we don't have even access to the very fundamental um, medicine. How do we approach the, making it more balanced? Thank you. You know, the, the biopharmaceutical industries and medicine oops, is 10% uh, of the total health care spend. The other 90% of course is um, in physician, hospital, acute care, long-term care. Um, our, the, the, our job is an important part of the job is to develop the medicines that physicians and hospitals and clinics can use. Equally important if not more important is the development of the health care system that allows those medicines to be brought to patients. In most of the world, that has been a province of the government. And so the government design uh, of a health care system, the ability of the govern governments to afford a health care system is, is the, the biggest determinant of whether or not the patients of any given country or any given region are going to have access to that health care. Um, and so that, that is their role. We have to help support it. Um, and we do help support it. We have this dilemma, for example, now in, in China, which wants both. So how do you at the same time develop an industry that produces the innovation, not just in medicines, but in devices and in, in therapeutics and, uh, and, and bring health care to their population? They have to, we, and we have to work together to solve both, but it is in that model, the country that provides, the, the state provides the health care system. Tom, I want to invite you to weigh in on that yeah. if you'd like to. I, I, can just, I can just add on that one. I mean, the, the, obviously, the, the important role of the state in providing the health care infrastructure, particularly in terms of, of just uh, reducing, reducing distance between population and clinics, reducing distance between them and, and, and their primary health care providers is something that uh, I think there's, there's incredible state involvement in that. One of the challenges that we see, and this brings us back to the rule of law and to transparency, is, is the, the willingness of the central state to make resources available to regions, provinces, districts, so that that kind of development can take place. We have a rigorous set of timekeepers uh, in the back. We have time for one more short question. I'm told we have a minute left, but I'm going to squeeze out every little bit. So we have a question right here. Here's a microphone. Thank you. My name is Lola. I'm from Nigeria. Um, it's just a comment. 
Will it be right to say that there are some kind of diseases like HIV, AIDS, that um, the Western world will not want to find a cure to it now because um, they've spent so much amount of money in research and when they find a cure for it now, it's no longer like a commercial venture for them? Let me say this, we are, we are out of time for this panel, but what I love about this is it's a small gathering and I, I know some of you have other comments and questions. I hope over the course of the day you'll engage uh, both John and Tom because that's our, that is our central purpose here. So thank you very much, John and Tom, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for your questions. <laughs>